Now, a lot of cycling analysts or cycling historians point to this moment between the 1990 season and the 1991 season as the sport gone, becoming high octane, we'll call it, that something happened in the peloton at about that point. You stopped winning. Other riders that maybe didn't have your talent started winning. Would you point to that moment around oh, 90 absolutely. to 91 as the high octane moment? 100%. A dramatic change. Although I don't think any of us recognize it at the time. Not so I look back, I go, okay, I'm on the individual, not at my best. And in 1990, our team on the team classification. And so even that next year, the Travidley was already a telltale sign. I mean, most of our team couldn't make it two weeks in the Tour of Italy. We all ended up, I had to retire after two weeks in the, in the Tour of Italy. It was going too fast. Now, I had always allergies. I, I never always felt a little off the Tour, Tour of Italy, but it turns out I had really bad grass allergies and it was worse in May. But um, our team didn't finish. And then um, the irony is when I go home, I didn't have a power meter at that time, but I went home and I had a Vespa. That's where I, where I did a, you know, efforts up climbs. But the Vespa is always my time trial ability. I could I could tell what that speed I could do and how long I could sustain it. I was I was riding as well as 1986 um, prior to the Tour de France that year, and uh, I felt even though my results weren't showing, I couldn't figure out why. <laughs> um, you know, but I was so used to kind of not feeling good this early season and then coming back that it it, it I, after I got shot. Before that, I you know I was consistent from February to, through through the Tour de France even after that, but I got so used to kind of coming from behind. But prior to that tour, I was I knew I was riding really well. In fact, I was second in the prologue in the first uh, stage in Saint Etienne. I I was so strong, and I took two and a half minutes on everybody. And even the team title, I led. I forgot what we didn't do that well, but I rode fifty sixty percent of the time up front. And I just felt to my wife, I said, this is going to be one of my easier Tour de France ever. It was significantly better in 1990, significantly better. But even five days into that stage, into the, I think we're going into Rennes, in the Champagne, capital of, uh, of France. I, I don't know, how to, it's kind of, however you want to pronounce it. My French is worse Reims, than yours. Reims, I go Reims, Reims, Reims. Um, anyways, and we were doing speeds up these climbs that I'd never experienced. And of course, I go, God, I told my wife, I said, I hope I'm as good as I feel. But it was kind of, I just still remember the stage going, wow, I, this is speeds that I never really recognized. But again, I didn't think, I thought maybe I just wasn't as good. But I ended up, you know, basically winning the time trial, a, a prologue. I was at eight second. And uh, normally, if I'm doing well, the prologue, if I feel good, the prologue, I'm, I'm good. I'm back. And, uh, so that was a surprise, and, and we each day, typically in the Tour de France, historically, every year, if we're all humans, we all race hard, and, and then there's always a fourth or fifth day that there's a lag. It's like everybody still gets fatigued at the same time, so there's a couple of days where they're, you know, especially long stages of riding easy, then it's the battle again. And that's the first tour uh, in my whole career that never had a let up. We didn't have that five-day lag. Um, I look back, I, I, I know it's doing well because I, you know, the time trials today are very short, but this, the first real long time trial was 70 kilometers. Uh, Interad became, turned out to be, you know, five turn tour rents, tour de France, I mean, great time trials, but, you know, I'm going to say this, I don't, I'm not accusing anybody, but, um, there's a history of Conconi in relationship with, uh, the Van Asso team. And I don't know Vindran, what he was doing, but what, if he was, I don't know, but I know that time trial was only, I already was, I was eight seconds behind him in 70 kilometers. So I know that I was racing at the top of my game at that tour. And I think it was three days later, this was, was the, the probably the, the eye opener. And I still remember looking at Charlie Mote, who won that stage, but we were racing at Denant and it was a hundred and it's 240 kilometer stage. Uh, we stopped three times for a train, but we averaged like over 50 kilometers an hour. And in the last hour and a half, we were doing 60, 70 kilometers. And I'm going, never, never experienced that. And I think three days later into a stage in the Jaca, Haka, Jaca, in, in Spain, um, 
I was virtual leader. I think Luke LeBlanc might have had the yellow jersey. I can't remember. It's kind of a, a uh, I, it's funny when I race, I can remember every stage, but when you're not, it, they become like a nightmare. Uh, but it was a really hot stage and, you know, I was, I was struggling, but I had no teammates that day and it was extremely hot. And, um, uh, I had run out of, uh, out of, of drinks, um, 60 Ks before the finish and everybody else has got getting feeds. My team car wasn't with me because you were following everybody in the back and, and I've come down and 30, 30 Ks to go. And I'm, I'm like, it'd be, a, I need water. And Roger refused to, refused to do it because it's going to be a 10 or 20 second penalty. And I finally, I, you know, was going to get off my bike and let's give it, I had a finish. He just wiped out and I had like heat stroke that day. And, uh, but it's the, I think when I look back to the cumulative fatigue, you know, with everybody's on EPO and the speeds like this, I think one of my strengths is I had a very high VO2 max in over three weeks. My, I was always just not working as hard as everybody every day. And, and at the end of the three weeks, um, my recovery was incredible. And I, in fact, you know, I went to the Tour de France, I rarely lost more than a kilo or two, um, which is really advantage, it's a big advantage uh, when you're racing a tour. But then 1991, um, I never had a day to recover. And uh, and I, I do look back, if I didn't have that stage in the Zaka, what would I, how would I finish? But I, I, I look back, it was a nightmare Tour de France for me. I still look back, I did pretty good. I even got second or third, I think third place the last time trial, but that was the, that was the, such a dramatic change from all the tours that I ever did before that. It wasn't how, even the same How race. open was the secret, Greg? Because I, I have a friend, and I, I won't say who it is because everyone will know who he is. Uh, he was riding a Vuelta a España in the mid 90s. And he said at that point, he was basically sure there was only him and two or three other guys who weren't taking EPO in the race. And every night his team would be saying to him, like, just take it. Like, why are you putting yourself through this? Just take it. It's so much easier once you take it. And he eventually caved and he took it. And he said the difference was just phenomenal. But at that point, he said he almost knew for a fact there was him and two or three others. They were just the whipping yep. boys at the back of the bunch that weren't taking it. He said he could hardly go back for a bottle because every day the speed was just pinned 48, 50 kilometers an hour. So if you like this video, you should definitely check out this video because I know you're going to love it. And don't forget to subscribe to the channel.